we're going to talk about deliverance here today. How many thought that we we're going to talk about something else than the deliverance? Let me see. Anyone? You know. Oh, three people. Oh, you didn't know me then. <laughs> deliverance is something I love to talk about, but we're not going to just talk about out, out, out. We're going to go a little bit deeper today on, on, on the temple of God. Hallelujah. We're going to talk about the temple of God today. How many know that you are the temple of God? Now, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, uh, throughout the Old Testament, God Almighty established to the priesthood how the house of God should be built. And He ordained that this is where my spirit will dwell on earth. God instructed, especially if you read the book of Exodus from 25 chapters and forward, not my favorite chapters, absolutely. It's like, oh, and the cu it's going to be three cubics, this, and they're going to be this far and this long and stuff. Many times I skip it, unfortunately. But today we're going to dive deep into it. Hallelujah. How many are excited to see more about the temple of God? Praise God. God ordained uh, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, that this will be where His Spirit will dwell. And, and um, the tabernacle, the temple of God, consists of three courts. It's the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. And it is in the holy of holies that his spirit dwelt. As you can see here, the outer courtyard surrounds the holy place and the holy of holies on all sides. And I believe that the tabernacle, the temple of God, as it was ordained by God in the old covenant, is a direct representation of the temple of God today. In the book of Acts chapter 7, Stephen said, and in the book of Acts chapter 17, Apostle Paul also said that God, through the new covenant, when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, God no longer dwells in buildings made by men. I'm going to go to the book of 1 Corinthians to give you an exact answer on where God dwells in case you hadn't figured it out yet. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Just like the temple of God in the old covenant had three courts, the temple of God in the new covenant, which is you and I, have three courts. We have the body, we have the soul, and we have the spirit. And just like the presence of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies in the Old Covenant, it still dwells in the Holy of Holies today. Your spirit is where God dwells. This is where the Spirit of God dwells in your heart. And the reason why we're going through this is because some might be here today confused. Because maybe you have been told by someone that you can't have a demon because you have said a prayer of salvation. I know I'm, I'm going to be treading a little bit on, on, on thin ice here and there during today's sermon. And some of you might feel like I'm stabbing you a little bit. I promise I'm going to do it really slow and gently. I'm not going to be doing like this. I'm going to be really so you can be like, okay, yeah, okay, deeper. Oh, yeah. I'm, I want you to, to, to feel the pain, but to, to manage to endure it, okay? So the reason why we're going through this is so that no one is confused of whether Christians can have demons. Now I want to go to the book of Matthew 21. Uh, in the book of Matthew 21, you can read it at, at your convenience. Something very interesting happened. Now Jesus was out walking and he passed by the temple of God in Jerusalem. And he noticed that merchants and traders, buyers and sellers were selling in the temple courts. And what happened? He was angered. If you read the version in Luke, he says that he even took leather cords and literally made a whip. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, he made a whip out of leather cords. And he went into the temple and he drove them out of the temple courts. Now listen to this. They were in the outer courts of the temple. Defilement was happening in the outer courts, but the Holy of Holies was intact. That is to show you that there can be defilement in the temple of God, yet the Spirit of God in that temple is unaffected. 
Jesus went in and he drove them out. I, I think he even cast them out, right? It's like we should do what Jesus does and cast that defilement out sometimes. Jesus Christ, the Bible says that seal for God's house consumed him. I believe that in our day and generation, the zeal for his house still consumes Jesus Christ. He's still angered when he, see, when he sees that there is defilement in my temple. And that is why he has ordained you and I to drive that defilement out of the temple courts. That is what you're gonna see here today. You're gonna see merchants, traders, sellers and buyers in your temple. Those merchants might be called spirit of lust or spirit of anger or spiritual husband or wife, whatever it is called. They are being driven out. They are being driven out today in Jesus name. And I'm going to touch a little bit on some of, of the background to this. And this is going to go a little bit into a teaching here just for a couple of minutes. Because many people come here, they receive deliverance and they even share testimony. I received partial freedom, but I am coming back for more freedom. And I want to let you know that deliverance is a journey. But if I know something about journeys, every journey has an end. Deliverance, the confrontation between light and darkness is final. Listen to this. There was a set amount of merchants in the temple court. Jesus didn't peel a layer off of them and then came back to peel another layer off the merchants. Deliverance was final. Now there are six reasons and, and I want you to stay with me. Six reasons why people seem to come back for deliverance again. And I want to puncture these little lies so that you can walk in your freedom. Because it's not meant, we are not meant to walk from deliverance to deliverance to deliverance to deliverance. No, we're meant to walk from deliverance to dominion to discipleship. <laughs> Number one reason why people uh, come back for deliverance is because the demon left but came back in. Let me tell you, what we teach in our pre-prayer counseling and what we tell people prior to deliverance is that you have some certain doors that needs to be closed. It is a complete package. It's not enough just to cast the demon out, but you need to be taught how to close the door so that they don't come back again. Remember that. Number two reason that some people come back for deliverance is because the demon actually never left. Some people, they mess with demons. They don't cast them out. It's dangerous business. When a demon is exposed, listen to this. God does not expose without the intention of expelling. If God has given you someone to pray for and a demon is exposed, you have the grace and the authority and the power to expel it. God doesn't give us something that we cannot bear. He doesn't give us something that we can't handle. You're like, oh, this demon is too big. I'm going to have to come back for this another time. No, you have been given the authority to cast it out. So maybe the demon actually didn't leave. Then it's understandable that someone comes back again for more deliverance. They're not coming back for more deliverance. They're just coming back for deliverance. Number three, some demons were not cast out. This is the same category as number two. Jesus Christ didn't ask some of the merchants to leave and then, hey, you, bro, you're, I'm going to come back tomorrow. He cast them all out, okay? Occasionally, it can happen though that not all demons are cast out. And in such case, it is important to seek deliverance. That is why we do our pre-prayer counseling so that people will go through the whole thing and realize, okay, this might be another demon here. I never realized this. This might be another one. I never realized that so that they all can be addressed. Because when Jesus steps into the temple, his purpose is to clean it out. He's not coming in to talk to those guys and see if they can reduce their prices. He's sending them out. And number four, and now we're getting into the more interesting one. 
the demon's legal right wasn't revoked. This is also things that we teach here, part of discipleship. That's why we don't just go from deliverance to deliverance. We go from deliverance to dominion. The legal right needs to be revoked. Sometimes there are family curses, unforgiveness. There are things that you need to renounce. Secret sins or spiritual uh, subscriptions that you need to cancel. When those legal rights are canceled and preferably before deliverance, okay? That's what we have been doing with you guys uh, out in the pre-prayer counseling is to cancel it. So that every legal right, because otherwise Jesus Christ will come in and say, you guys, you're coming out of the temple grounds. And someone is like, excuse me, look at the rug here. It says the Smith family. I'm Smith family. I, 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 I was invited here. I belong here. You can't drive someone out of the house that they own. The legal right must be revoked. They are strangers. They are not inhabitants of the temple grounds. Number five. The demon... It's on the outside, lying that it's on the inside. Many people, and now this is actually, people come back for deliverance and they're like, Pastor, I think I need more deliverance. And if this is you today, I am in no way trying to call you out or to offend you. I'm trying for you to grow so that you can understand, wow, okay, I'm feeling some things, but that feeling, that's not the sign of a demon. Demons can be on the outside, lying to you that I'm still inside. Satan is the father of lies. There is nothing, no essence of God can be in him. It's impossible. There's nothing of God in the devil. And God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That means those demons, when they are telling you that we're still inside, they are lying. Demons ain't telling you the truth. How do I know? Because before your deliverance, they were never telling you we're inside. No, they were saying, we're not here. We're not here. And then when they're out, they're like, yeah, we, were, we are here now. We are here now. Whatever they say, whatever that thing is nudging you, that whispering when you know that's not the voice of God, something is, something is disturbing me, I'm under attack. Whatever that voice is saying, the opposite is the actual truth. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Final point. The person has developed a spiritual or an emotional muscle memory. How many know what a muscle memory is? You know what a muscle memory is. The best way to explain a muscle memory to those who don't know is a golfer. Golfers have some of the best muscle memory in the world or even basketball players. A muscle memory basically means that if I wake up a professional golfer from in the middle of the night, hey bro, 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 wake up, wake up, hit the ball, hit the ball, he will still swing perfectly out of the middle of deep sleep because his muscles are trained to do a certain movement. He can do it blindfolded. He does, it doesn't matter, it's been trained. The same goes for our spiritual and emotional life. I'm gonna give you an example. I grew up in a Pentecostal church in Sweden. God bless Pentecostal churches. Very much, bless them. We love them with all of our hearts. I grew up uh, uh, Pentecostal. I mean, I'm, I'm still, Pentecost is biblical, I mean. <laughs> so, so I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and anytime when we were having a prayer meeting or something, we'd be praying, kind of waiting for the Spirit of God, and everyone was soaking in His presence. God, come and touch us here today. And the way that you knew that the Spirit of God had ascended in the church building, there was an elderly woman always sitting at the back row. Nobody would ever take her seat, because everyone knew that is that woman's seat. Some of us may be that person. Nobody takes your seat because they know that's your seat. God bless you if you are that person. So when the Spirit of God would begin to fall in the house of God, she would sit in the back and we would all be waiting. And this was the sign that we knew that God had arrived in the building. And she started reacting to the Spirit of God. So we were all like, yep, that's the fire alarm. Holy Spirit has arrived. And she would do it every time she sensed the presence of God. Nothing wrong with it. Bless her soul. But the Bible says, God said, my manna is new for you every morning. The way that God touched you and you experienced his touch yesterday doesn't mean that it has to be the same today. So people develop an emotional and spiritual muscle memory. 
Some, some of us, when we experienced a touch from God first time, really strong, we cried uncontrollably. <laughs> And God was touching us in such a beautiful, pure way. And then next time, when we come back and we start feeling the Spirit of God in the atmosphere, we go from having our emotional reaction being a result of the Holy Spirit touching us, we go to become the prerequisite for the Holy Spirit to touch us instead. Emotional reactions isn't a prerequisite for a touch from the Holy Spirit. So what happens? I feel the Spirit of God. Let me just try to cry the way I did that time. And I believe that Jesus will touch me the same way. <laughs> and what happens is that that emotional reaction that you're having to the Spirit of God is hindering the Spirit of God from actually touching you. If you feel nothing, just stand. If you feel nothing, just sit. You don't have to exert some kind of emotional reaction for God to touch you. He touches you irrespective of your feelings. And the same goes for deliverance. People, when they experience deliverance, that might have been the most powerful encounter that they ever had with God. And they were doing, oh, and they couldn't control it. Now, you're, you're, you might laugh. That's okay. I'm, I'm, if, you, if you saw my deliverance, I was doing way more than just, oh, so, so I'm not trying to, if we have someone here today that is going to react to the Spirit of God, no judgment, okay? Whatever happens is going to happen. But if you react the same way every single time, maybe you have put your emotional reaction as a prerequisite rather than a result of God touching you. So you feel the presence of God and because when you receive deliverance, for me personally, when I receive my deliverance might have been the most powerful encounter I've ever had with the Holy Spirit. Maybe, maybe, I'm not quite sure, but for many of us, it will be where you experience the touch of God so powerful you've never experienced it before. So what happens next time? That's how I reacted when the Spirit of God touched me. Let me just do it again. And it becomes tradition and tradition leads to religion. Let be open. Whatever happens, happens. Many of us think that we need more deliverance. You don't need more deliverance. You need to change your focus from going for confrontational prayer. What you're going to see here is confrontation between light and darkness. There, you need to sw switch your focus from confrontation to confession. I'm not talking about confession of God's word, which is important and a big part of the Christian life. I'm literally talking about the actual confession of sin. Confession of sin. I've been through deliverance and I've done some serious confessions too. Deliverance and confession, they are very similar. Hear me out. Many people go for confrontation. And what confrontation is, what deliverance is, deliverance uproots the weeds. But confession kills the seeds before they grow roots. So you have received deliverance. The weeds that have grown in your life, in your garden, have been uprooted. Don't wait for six years and come back for deliverance again. Confess those things when the devil is pouring his seeds all around us, in our gardens, through internet, social media. Confess those things to kill the seeds before they grow roots. Deliverance is reactive. You are, you are responding to something that has been established. Confession is proactive. You are not giving Satan a foothold. Confession of sin is like, no, uh-uh, not here. I, I might have seen something or done something or thought something or dreamt something. But hey, that's not going to grow roots in this soil. Not today, Satan. My garden has already been cleansed. I need to maintain it. I don't need another gardening job. Deliverance is coming for help for prayer, for the chains to be broken. Confession is you standing up, 
taking control of your life and disarming the enemy of your soul. Now, I know this is a sensitive topic and I'm going to go into the practicalities of it. Some of us are like, oh yeah, confession is good. I confess to, confess to God every day in my prayer chamber. And that's good. 100% that's good. Glory be to Jesus Christ. But if you're anything like me, okay, I know through my life, some of the things that I struggled with, I would confess to God every 45 minutes. I never overcame them. Why? Because when you are confessing to God, unfortunately, this is not how it should be, but this is how it is for many. Your confession to God in private doesn't actually bring you to genuine repentance. You are confessing because you feel bad. You're not confessing because you actually want to turn away from it. At that moment, you're like, oh God, I know if I die this exact moment, I might not even go to heaven. It's really bad. God, forgive me. I will never do it again. If you forgive me this time, it's different, Lord. And then you get up. And then if you're anything like how I used to be, just a couple of, maybe I confess in the morning and in the evening, here I come again. God, how do I even, in the morning I said, I'll never do it again. God, just forgive me. I'm hopeless. And you fail to realize that it's because you're not coming to genuine repentance. Just like deliverance is done in public here. We, we do both public and private deliverances. Some people prefer private deliverances. I always encourage public deliverance. Why? Because there's evidence of your freedom. The Bible says, who puts the light under the cover? Nobody. Who will you share with? People are going to be like, oh yeah, you received deliverance. Oh, that, that's cool. Pixar, it didn't happen. <laughs> video, it didn't happen. And some of us are like, no, I don't want to be video. And that's okay. Bless you. I, my deliverance was public. It's on YouTube. And I go back and I rejoice because I know the moment the devil is trying to tell me something, I will play the video and I will tell him, hey, you know what? I don't belong to you anymore. This is my past and this is not who I am today. So just like deliverance is better, in my opinion, in public. Confession too, sometimes. You need to confess to your pastor. Because it's way harder to not be genuinely repentant when someone is listening to you. It's like God, you know, he will forgive you forever. But then when you tell your pastor, hey, I fell into adultery, pastor. And then tomorrow again, pastor, I fell in. They will be like, excuse me? And they'll be like, yeah, I'll confess only to God next time. <laughs> it's much harder. So sometimes just like deliverance in public, sometimes you also need to confess so that you can come to the point of genuine repentance. Who do you confess your sin to? Is it your pastor, your mentor? your life group leader, your husband or your wife. Where is that confession? I believe just like, I'm going to read a couple of Bible verses. It's Spirit of God is up on the stage here. I don't know about down there. It's hot up here. It's probably a little bit of my own body heat too, but Spirit of God is here. Bible talks about confession of sin a lot. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other. Oh. Not only to God, okay? Okay. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Daniel 9 20, Leviticus 5 15, Proverbs 28 13, Acts 3 19, Psalm 32 verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. It's time to come back to the truth. Acts chapter 19. Revival broke out in Ephesus. When Apostle Paul came there and preached about the kingdom of God. And I want to read it for you really quickly. If I can book, find Acts after the book of John. Going good here. Acts chapter 19. Paul came to Ephesus and started preaching the kingdom of God. Signs and wonders were happening. The seven sons of Sceva were there. 
and a lot of stuff happened. And then from verse 17, it says, This became known both to all Jews and Greece dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their sins. Not only the unbelievers, it's the believers they came confessing here. Also, verse 19, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books and they came and surrendered their idols. Confession of sin and surrendering of idols. And what happened in verse 20? So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I think what it says here, the word of God grew mightily and prevailed, is Bible lingo for revival broke out. The only way that revival can be sustained in our day and generation is through a culture of purity in the house of God. And culture of purity can only be established through transparency in the body of Christ. Confession of sin leads to culture of purity. Culture of purity is what sustains revival. Hallelujah. Ooh, I'm, I know I'm, I'm shouting a lot. I, I am so sorry. I, this is exciting. I want to talk about one last thing and then we're going to round up here today. Worship team, if you can come up and help me give some heavenly tones. <sighs> Hallelujah. Confession is part of the process of sanctification. Sanctification is dying to sin more and more, living to righteousness more and more. Pastor Vlad has been preaching about it for weeks. I hope you captured it. There's such fundamental secrets in it. The sanctification process of the believers, understanding that I'm no longer belonging to the old covenant where God dwelt in buildings. He dwells within me. So what happens? How many here knows how sanctification is done? Sanctification, how does it happen? There's a Bible verse and I'm going to remind you about it in John 17. It literally says how to be sanctified. John 17. Verse 17. I mean, look, John 17. John 17, 16. They are not of the world. This is Jesus praying for the believers. He's praying for you and I. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The process of sanctification happens after deliverance. And I will explain to you why. If you can bring the, the different things here. I've been doing my tea here for a while. It's been soaking. How many know that, you know, life is like a cup of tea sometimes? Not many. Okay, I'm going to explain to you why life is like a cup of tea today. If you can bring the water as well, Brian. Oh, it's there. Okay, can you come and hold this for just a moment? I know. You're going to get a little bit wet here. Okay. Life is like a cup of tea. How many can see that that tea bag, that scum bag, that dirt bag, whatever you want to call it, is making this water dirty. It's defiling the water in here. If you want to drink water, this ain't water, okay? This has been stained. It's been defiled. And there's something in here that is going to, no matter what you do, as long as this stays, it's going to keep getting dirty over time. Now, this is the Word of God. This is the Spirit of God. We are encouraged to be filled up with His Spirit. As we fill ourselves with His anointing and His Word and His Spirit. Woo! I can feel it. You know what happens? It makes, it makes it a little bit less dirty for some time. But if this dirt bag, scumbag, tea bag, whatever you call it, isn't removed, it's going to get stained again. The only way to get rid of the impurities that is in this water. It's by the removal of the tea bag. That is deliverance right there. Jesus Christ comes in, takes that tea bag, dirt bag, scum bag, whatever you want to call it, and removes it from your life. Thank you, Jesus. I am free. There's no more source of defilement within me. But what happened? I'm still dirty. I thought when I receive deliverance that everything is going to be fine. But when I look around, the, the, the symptoms of tea is still inside of me. So we begin to struggle. Oh God, 
remove this part of me, remove this part of me. But it's just too much. Meditation in New Age it says, empty yourself. It's a lie. You can't empty yourself of yourself. This is you. You can't empty yourself of yourself. You and the dirt are inseparable. And what happens many times after our deliverance, we still face something. Do you know what this is? How many know what this is? This is a sin. It's not a Jolly Rancher for those of you who thought so. You gotta be in spirit, guys. This is sin. After our deliverance, we might be tempted and fall into sin. And who, how many know that if that Jolly Rancher stays in there long enough, it's gonna start dissolving and the water and the Jolly Rancher becomes inseparable. And no matter how much you've been praying, that thing is there, the secret sin. It's hidden there. So it's hard to get rid of it if you don't use the spoon of confession after your deliverance and get rid of that stuff. Now listen, that's a sidetrack. That's a sidetrack. Confession of sin is part of it. But how to actually get rid of this? I was there. I prayed. God, help me overcome. Help me be better. I won't fall again. I will can I will throw everything out. God help me. But I seem to not be able to get that breakthrough. You know why? Because I was still focusing on the dirt. The Bible talks about Romans 12 verse 2, Colossians 3 verse 2. Renew your mind. Let your mind rise and seek the things that are above. And what you need to do, you know what? The devil is actually happy the longer you're praying against God. In Jesus' name I pray. May my water be purified by your grace, Lord. God, in Jesus, I will not fall. Today I will not fall in this sin again. I will not fall in this sin again. In Jesus' name, I resist your thought. Go away in the name of Jesus. And you spend half your day fighting against the thing that you don't want to fall in. The devil rejoices because even though you didn't fall in the sin, your focus, your attention, your concentration is on that thing, distracting you from letting your mind rise and seek the things that are above. The only way that you can truly experience repentance is to stop focusing on getting rid of your problems and start focusing on filling yourself up with the Word of God, with the Spirit of God. The more you fill yourself, the more that dirt is going to remove. And as a side product, as a byproduct of you pressing in, those things will be gone in your life. Put your hands together for Jesus. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.